Welcome. It's time for chapter two of the picture of Dorian Gray. Let us begin. As they entered, they saw Dorian Gray. He was seated at the piano with his back to them, turning over the pages of a volume of Schumann's Forest Scenes. You must lend me these, Basil, he cried. I want to learn them. They are perfectly charming. That entirely depends on how you sit today, Dorian. Oh, I'm tired of sitting. I don't want a life-size portrait of myself, answered the lad, swinging around on the music stool in a willful, petulant manner. When he caught sight of Lord Henry, a faint blush colored his cheeks for a moment, and he started up. I beg your pardon, Basil. I didn't know you had anyone with you. This is Lord Henry Wotton, Dorian. He's an old Oxford friend of mine. I have just been telling him what a capital sitter you were, and now you have spoiled everything. You have not spoiled my pleasure in meeting you, Mr. Gray, said Lord Henry, stepping forward and shaking him by the hand. My aunt has often spoken about you. You are one of her favorites, and, I'm afraid, one of her victims also. I'm in Lady Agatha's black books at the present, answered Dorian with a funny look of penitence. I promised to go to her club in Whitechapel with her last Tuesday, and I really forgot all about it. We would have played a duet together, three duets, I believe. I don't know what she will say to me. I am far too frightened to call. Oh, I will make peace with my aunt. She is quite devoted to you. And I don't think it really matters about your not being there. The audience probably thought it was a duet when Aunt Agatha sits down to a piano. She makes quite enough noise for two people. That is very horrid to her, and not very nice to me, answered Dorian, laughing. Lord Henry looked at him. Yes, he was certainly wonderfully handsome, with a finely curved scarlet lips. His frank blue eyes, his crisp golden hair. There was something in his face that made one trust him at once. All the candor of youth was there, as well as all the youth's passionate purity. One felt that he had kept himself unspotted from the world. No wonder Basil Howard worshipped him. He was made to be worshipped. You're too charming to go in for philanthropy, Mr. Gray. Far too charming. And Lord Henry flung himself down on the divan and opened his cigarette case. Howard had been busy mixing his colors and getting his brushes ready. He was looking worried. And when he heard Lord Henry's last remark, he glanced at him, hesitated for a moment, and then said, Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it awfully rude of me if I asked you to go away? Lord Henry smiled and looked at Dorian Gray. Am I to go, Mr. Gray? he asked. Oh, please don't, Lord Henry. I see Basil's in one of his sulky moods, and I can't bear him when he sulks. Besides, I want you to tell me why I should not go in for philanthropy. I don't know that I shall tell you that, Mr. Gray, but I certainly will not run away. Now that you have asked me to stop, you don't really mind, Basil, do you? You have often told me you liked your sitters to have someone to chat to. Howard bit his lip. If Dorian wishes it, then, of course, you can. You must stay. Dorian's whims are laws to everybody except himself. Lord Henry took up his hat and gloves. You are very pressing, Basil, but I'm afraid I must go. I have promised to meet a man at the Orleans. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Come and see me some afternoon on Curzon Street. I am nearly always home at five o'clock. Write to me when you are coming. I should be sorry to miss you. Basil, cried Dorian Gray, if Lord Henry goes, I shall go too. You never open your lips while you are painting, and it is horribly dull standing on a platform trying to look pleasant. Ask him to stay. I insist upon it. Stay, Harry, to oblige Dorian, and to oblige me, said Howard, gazing intently at his picture. It is quite true. I never talk when I'm working, and never listen either, and it must be dreadfully tedious to my unfortunate sitters. I, I beg you to stay. But what about my man at the Orleans? 
Howard laughed. I don't think that there'll be any difficulty about that. Sit down again, Harry. And now, Dorian, get up on that platform and don't move about too much or pay any attention to what Lord Henry says. He has a very bad influence over all of his friends, with the exception of myself. Dorian stepped up on the dais with the air of a young Greek martyr and made a little move of discontent to Lord Henry, to whom he had rather taken a fancy. He was so unlike Howard, they made a delightful contrast, and he had such a beautiful voice. After a few moments, he said to him, Have you really a very bad influence, Lord Henry? As bad as Basil says. There is no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immoral. Immoral from the scientific point of view. Why? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think his natural thoughts or burn with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. He becomes an echo of someone else's music. An actor of a part that had not been written for him. The aim of life is self-development. To realize one's nature perfectly, that is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties. The duty that one owes oneself, of course, they are charitable. They feed the hungry and clothe the beggar, but their own souls starve and are naked. Courage had gone out of our race. Perhaps we never really had it. The terror of society, which is the basis of morals, the terror of God, which is the secret of religion. These are the two things that govern us, and yet... Just turn your head a little more to the right, Dorian. Like a good boy, said Howard, deep in his work, and conscious only that a look had come into the lad's face that he had never seen before. And yet, continued Lord Henry in his low, musical voice, with that graceful wave of the hand that was so characteristic of him, and that even in his Eton days he believed that if one man were to live his life out fully and completely, were to give form to every feeling, expression to every thought, reality to every dream, I believe that the world would gain such a fresh impulse of joy that we would forget all of the maladies of medievalism and return to the Hellenic ideal. Something finer, richer than the Hellenic ideal it may be. But the bravest man among us is afraid of himself. The mutilation of the savage has its tragic survival in the self-denial that mars our lives. We are punished for our refusals. Every impulse that we strive to strangle broods in the mind and poisons us. The body sins once and has done with its sin, for action is a mode of purification. Nothing remains then but the recollection of pleasure, or the luxury of a regret. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Resist it, and your soul grows sick with longing for things it has forbidden to itself with desire for what its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. It has been said that the great events of the world take place in the brain. It is in the brain, and only the brain, that the great sins of the world take place also. You, Mr. Gray, you yourself, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, you have had passions that have made you afraid. Thoughts that have filled you with terror, daydreams, and sleeping dreams, whose mere memory might stain your cheek with shame. Stop, murmured Dorian Gray. Stop, you bewilder me. I don't know what to say. There is some answer to you, but I cannot find it. Don't speak. Let me think. Or rather, let me try not to think. For nearly ten minutes, he stood there motionless, with parted lips and eyes strangely bright. He was dimly conscious that entirely fresh impulses were at work within him, and they seemed to have come really from himself. The few words that Basil's friend had said to him, words spoken by chance no doubt, and were willful paradox in them, had yet touched some secret chord that had never been touched before. 
but that he felt was now vibrating and throbbing to curious pulses. Music had stirred him like that. Music had troubled him many times. But music was not articulate. It was not a new world, but rather a new chaos that it created in us. Words. Mere words. How terrible they were. How clear and vivid and cruel. One could not escape from them, and yet, what a subtle magic there was in them. They seemed to be able to give a plastic form to lifeless things and have a music of their own as sweet as that of viol or of lute. Mere words, was there anything so real as words? Yes, there had been things in his boyhood that he had not understood. He understood them now. Life suddenly became fiery colored to him. It seemed to him that he had been walking in fire. Why had he not known it? Lord Henry watched him with his sad smile. He knew the precise psychological moment when to say nothing. He felt intensely interested. He was amazed at the sudden impression that his words had produced, and, remembering a book that he had read when he was sixteen which had revealed to him much that had not been known before, he wondered whether Dorian Gray was passing through the same experience. He had merely shot an arrow into the air. Had it hit its mark? How fascinating the lad was. Howard painted away with that marvelous bold touch of his, that had the true refinement and perfect delicacy that come only from strength. He was unconscious of the silence. Basil, I'm tired of standing, cried Dorian Gray suddenly. I must go sit in the garden. The air is stifling in here. My dear fellow, I'm so sorry. When I'm painting, I can't think of anything else, but you never sat better. You were perfectly still, and I caught the effect I wanted, the half-parted lips and the bright look in the eyes. I don't know what Harry has been saying to you, but he certainly made you have the most wonderful expression. I suppose he had been paying you compliments. You mustn't believe a word he says. He certainly hasn't been paying me compliments. Perhaps that is the reason I don't think I believe anything he has told me. You know you believe it all, said Lord Henry, looking at him with his dreamy, heavy-lidded eyes. I will go out to the garden with you. It is hardly hot in the studio, Basil. Let us have something iced to drink. Something with strawberries in it. Certainly, Harry. Just touch the bell, and when Parker comes, I will tell him what you want. I've got to work up the background, so I will join you later, Han. Don't keep Dorian too long. I have never been in better form for painting than I am today. This is going to be my masterpiece. It is my masterpiece as it stands. Lord Henry went out to the garden and found Dorian Gray burying his face in the great, cool lilac blossoms, feverishly drinking in their perfume as if it had been wine. He came close to him and put his hand upon his shoulder. You are quite right to do that, he murmured. Nothing can cure the soul but the senses. Just as nothing can cure the senses but the soul. The lad started and drew back. He was bareheaded, and the leaves had tossed his rebellious curls and tangled all their gilded threads. There was a look of fear in his eyes, such as people have when they are suddenly awakened. His finely chiseled nostrils quivered, and some hidden nerve shook the scarlet of his lips and left them trembling. Yes, continued Lord Henry, that is one of the great secrets of life. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by the means of the soul. You are a wonderful creature. You know more than you think you know, just as you know less than you want to know. Dorian Gray frowned and turned his head away. He could not help liking the tall, graceful man who was standing by him. His romantic, olive-colored face and worn expression interested him. There was something in his low, languid voice that was absolutely fascinating. His cool, white, flower-like hands even had a curious charm. They moved as he spoke like music and seemed to have a language of their own. But he felt afraid of him, and ashamed for being afraid. Why had it been left for a stranger to reveal him to himself? He had known Basil Howard for months, but their friendship between them had never altered him. 
Suddenly, there had come someone across his life who seemed to have disclosed to him life's mystery. And yet, what was there to be afraid of? He was not a schoolboy or a girl. It was absurd to be frightened. Let us go and sit in the shade, said Lord Henry. Parker has brought out the drinks, and if you stay any longer in this glare, you will be quite spoiled, and Basil will never paint you again. You really must not let yourself become sunburnt. It would be very unbecoming to you. What does it matter? cried Dorian, laughing as he sat down at the seat at the end of the garden. It should matter everything to you, Mr. Gray. Why? Because you have now the most marvelous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. No, you don't feel it now. Someday, when you are old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its lines and passion branded your lips with its hideous fires, you will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now, wherever you go, you charm the world. Will it always be so? You have a wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Gray. Don't frown. You have. And beauty is a form of genius. It is higher, indeed, than genius as it needs no explanation. It is one of the great facts of life. Like sunlight or springtime or the reflection in dark waters of that silver shell we call the moon, it cannot be questioned. It has its divine right of sovereignty, and makes princes of those who have it. You smile, ah. When you have lost it, you won't smile. People say sometimes that beauty is only superficial. That may be so. But at least it is not so superficial as thought. For me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Yes, Mr. Gray, the gods have been good to you, but what the gods give, they quickly take away. You have only a few years in which really to live. When your youth goes, your beauty will go with it, and then you'll suddenly discover there are no triumphs left for you. Or have to content yourself with those mean triumphs that the memory of your past will make more bitter than defeats. Every month, as it wanes, brings you nearer to something dreadful. Time is jealous of you, and wars against your lilies and your roses. You will become sallow and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Realize your youth while you have it. Don't squander the gold of your days listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure, or give away your life to the ignorant, the common, and the vulgar, which are the aims, the false ideals of our age. Live, live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism. That is what our century wants. You might be its visible symbol. With your personality, there is nothing you could not do. The world belongs to you for a season. The moment I met you, I saw you were quite unconscious of what you really are. What you really might be. There was so much about you that charmed me that I felt I must tell you something about yourself. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted, for there is such a little time that your youth will last such little time. The common hill flowers wither, but they bloom again. The labranum will be as golden next June as it is now, and in a month there will be purple stars on the clematis. And year after year, the green night of its leaves will have its purple stars, but we never get back our youth. The pulse of joy that beats in us at twenty becomes sluggish. Our limbs fail, our senses rot, we degenerate into hideous puppets haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were much too afraid. And the exquisite temptations that we did not dare yield to. Youth. Youth. There is absolutely nothing in the world but you. 
Dorian Gray listened, open-eyed and wondering. A spray of lilac fell from his hand upon the gravel. A furry bee came and buzzed round it for a moment. Then it began to scramble all over the fretted purple of the tiny blossoms. He watched it with that strange interest in trivial things that we try to develop when things of a high import make us afraid, or when we are stirred by some new emotion for which we cannot find expression, or when some thought that terrifies us lays sudden siege to the brain and calls on us to yield. After a time it flew away. He saw it creeping into the stained trumpet of a Tyrian convolvus. The flower seemed to quiver and then sway gently to and fro. Suddenly, Halward appeared at the door to the studio and made frantic signs for them to come in. They turned to each other and smiled. I am waiting, cried Halward, to come in. The light is quite perfect, and you can bring your drinks. They rose up and sauntered down the walk together. Two green and white butterflies fluttered past them, and in the pear tree at the end of the garden, a thrush began to sing. You are glad to have met me, Mr. Gray, said Lord Henry, looking at him. Yes, I am glad now. I wonder, shall I always be glad? Always. That is such a dreadful word. It makes me shudder when I hear it. Women are so fond of using it. They spoil every romance by trying to make it last forever. It is a meaningless word, too. The only difference between a caprice and a lifelong passion is that a caprice lasts a little longer. As they entered the studio, Dorian Gray put his hand upon Lord Henry's arm. In that case, let our friendship be a caprice, he murmured, flushing at his own boldness, and stepped upon the platform and resumed his pose. Lord Henry flung himself into a large wicker armchair and watched him. The sweep and dash of the brush on the canvas made the only sound that broke the stillness except when Howard stepped back now and then to look at his work from a distance in the slanting beams that streamed through the open doorway. The dust danced and was golden. The heavy scent of the roses seemed to brood over everything. After about a quarter of an hour, Howard stopped painting, looked for a long time at Dorian Gray, and then for a long time at the picture, biting the end of one of his huge brushes and smiling. It's quite finished, he cried at last, and stooping down, he wrote his name in thin vermilion letters on the left-hand corner of the canvas. Lord Henry came over and examined the picture. It was certainly a wonderful work of art, and a wonderful likeness as well. My dear fellow, I congratulate you most warmly, he said. Mr. Gray, come and look at yourself. The lad started, as if awakened from some dream. Is it really finished? he murmured, stepping down from the platform. Quite finished, said Howard, and you have sat splendidly today. I am awfully obliged to you. That is entirely due to me, broke in Lord Henry. Isn't it, Mr. Gray? Dorian made no answer, but passed listlessly in front of his picture and turned towards it. When he saw it, he drew back and his cheeks flushed for a moment with pleasure. A look of joy came into his eyes as if he had recognized himself for the first time. He stood there motionless and in wonder, dimly conscious, that Howard was speaking to him, but not catching the meaning of the words. The sense of his own beauty came on him like a revelation. He had never felt it before. Basil Howard's compliments had seemed to him to be merely the charming exaggerations of friendship. He had listened to them, laughed at them, forgotten them. They had not influenced his nature. Then had come Lord Henry, with his strange panegyric on youth, his terrible warning of its brevity. They had stirred him at the time, and now, as he stood gazing at the shadow of his own loveliness, the full reality of the description flashed across him. Yes, there would be a day when his face would be wrinkled and wizen, his eyes dim and colorless, the grace of his figure broken and deformed. The scarlet would pass away from his lips and the gold steal from his hair. The life that was to make his soul would mar his body. That he would become ennoble, hideous, and uncouth. As he thought of it, a sharp pang of pain struck like a knife across him and made each delicate fiber of his nature quiver. 
His eyes deepened into amethyst, and a mist of tears came across them. He felt as if a hand of ice had been laid upon his heart. Don't you like it? cried Howard at last, stung a little by the lad's silence and not understanding what it meant. Of course he likes it, said Lord Henry. Who wouldn't like it? It is one of the greatest things in modern art. I will give you anything you like to ask for it. I must have it. It is not my property, Harry. Whose property is it? Dorian's, of course. He is a very lucky fellow. How sad it is, murmured Dorian Gray, with his eyes still fixed upon his own portrait. How sad it is, I shall grow old and horrid and dreadful, but this picture will always remain young. It will never be older than this particular day of June. If it was only the other way, if it was I who were to always be young in the picture that would grow old. For this, for this I would give everything. Yes, there's nothing in the whole world I would not give. You would hardly care for that arrangement, Basil, cried Lord Henry, laughing. It would be rather hard lines on you. I should object very strongly, Harry. Dorian Gray turned and looked at him. I believe you would, Basil. You would like your art better than your friends. I am no more to you than a green bronze figure, hardly as much, I dare say. Howard stared in amazement. It was so unlike Dorian to speak like that. What had happened? He seemed almost angry. His face was flushed and his cheeks burning. Yes, he continued, I am less to you than your ivory Hermes or your silver fawn. You will like them always. How long will you like me? Till I have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know, now, that when one loses one's good looks, whatever that may be, one loses everything. Your picture has taught me that. Lord Henry is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I'm growing old, I will kill myself. Albert turned pale and caught his hand. Dorian, Dorian, don't talk like that. I have never had such a friend as you. I shall never have another such as you. You are not jealous of material things, are you? I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted of me. Why should it keep what I must lose? Every moment it passes takes something from me and gives something to it. Oh, if it was only the other way, if the picture could change, if I could always be what I am now. Why did you paint it? It will mock me someday, mock me horribly. Then hot tears welled into his eyes and he tore his hand away. And flinging himself on the divan, he buried his face in the cushions as if he was praying. This is your doing, Harry, said Howard bitterly. My doing? Yes, yours. You, you know it. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. It is the real Dorian Gray. That is all, he answered. It is not. If it is not, what have I got to do with it? You should have gone away when I asked you. I stayed when you asked me. Harry, I can't quarrel with my two best friends at once, but between you both you have made me hate the finest piece of work I have ever done, and I will destroy it. What is it but canvas and color? I will not let it come across three lives and mar them. Dorian Gray lifted his golden head from the pillow and looked up at him with a pallid face and tear-stained eyes as he walked over to the deal painting table that was set beneath the large curtain window. What was he doing there? His fingers were straying about among the litter of tin tubes and dry brushes seeking for something. Yes, it was the long palette knife with its thin blade of lithe steel. He had found it at last. He was going to rip up the canvas. With a stifled sob, he leapt from the couch and, rushing over to Howard, tore the knife out of his hand and flung it to the end of the studio. Don't, Basil, don't, he cried. It would be murder. I am glad you appreciate my work at last, Dorian, said Howard coldly, when I recovered from the surprise. I never thought you would. Appreciate it? I'm in love with it, Basil. It is part of myself. I feel that. Well, as soon as you are dry, you shall be varnished and framed and sent home. Then you could do with what yourself what you like. And he walked across the room and rang the bell for tea. You will have tea, of course, Dorian, and so will you, Harry. Tea is the only simple pleasure left to us. I don't like simple pleasure, said Lord Henry. 
I don't like scenes, except on the stage. What absurd fellows you are, both of you. I wonder who it is who has defined man as a rational animal. It was the most premature definition ever given. Man is many things, but he is not rational. I'm glad he is not, after all. Though I wish you chaps would not squabble over the picture. You had much better let me have it, Basil. This silly boy doesn't really want it, and I do. If you let anyone have it but me, Basil, I will never forgive you, cried Doria Gray, and I don't allow people to call me a silly boy. You know the picture is your story, and I gave it to you before it existed. And you know, you have been a little silly, Mr. Cray, and you don't really mind being called a boy. I should have minded very much this morning, Lord Henry. Ah, this morning. You have lived since then. There came a knock to the door, and the butler entered with the tea tray, and set it upon a small Japanese table. There was a rattle of cups and saucers, the hissing of a fluted Georgian urn. Two globe-shaped china dishes were brought in by a page. Dorian Gray went over and poured the tea out. The two men sauntered languidly to the table and examined what was under the covers. Let us go to the theater tonight, said Lord Henry. There should be something on somewhere. I've promised to dine at White's, but it's only with an old friend, so I can send him a wire and say that I'm ill or that I've prevented from coming in consequence of a subsequent engagement. I think that would be a rather nice excuse. He would have the surprise of candor. It is such a bore putting on one's dress clothes, Mother Howard, and when one has them on, they are so hard. Yes, answered Lord Henry dreamily. The costume of our day is detestable. It is so somber, so depressing. Sin is the only color element left in modern life. You must not say things like that before Dorian, Harry. Before which Dorian? The one who is pouring out tea for us, or the one in the picture? Before either? I should like to come to the theater with you, Lord Henry, said the lad. Then you shall come, and you will come too, Basil, won't you? I can't, really. I, I would sooner not. I have a lot of work to do. Well, then, you and I will go alone, Mr. Gray. I should like that awfully. Basil Howard bit his lip and walked over, cup in hand, to the picture. I will stay with the real Dorian, he said sadly. Is it the real Dorian? cried the original at the portrait, running across to him. Am I really like that? Yes, you are just like that. How wonderful, Basil. At least you are like it in appearance, but it will never alter, said Howard. That is something. What a fuss people make about fidelity, murmured Lord Henry. After all, it is purely a question for physiology. It has nothing to do with our own will. It is either an unfortunate accident or an unpleasant result of temperament. Young men want to be faithful and are not. Old men want to be faithless and cannot. It is all one can say. Don't go to the theater tonight, Dorian, said Howard. Stop and dine with me. I can't, really. Why? Because I have promised Lord Henry I'd go with him. He won't like you better for keeping your promises. He always breaks his own. I beg you not to go. Dorian Gray laughed and shook his head. I entreat you. The lad laughed and looked over at Lord Henry, who was watching them go from the tea table with an amused smile. I must go, Basil, he answered. Very well, said Howard, and he walked over and laid his cup down the tray. It is rather late, and as you have to dress, you had better lose no time. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Come by tomorrow. Certainly. You won't forget. No, of course not. And Harry... Yes, Basil. Remember what I asked you when in the garden this morning? I have forgotten it. I trust you. I wish I could trust myself, said Lord Henry, laughing. Hum, Mr. Gray, my hansom is outside, and I can drop you at your place. Goodbye, Basil. It had been a most interesting afternoon. As the door closed behind them, Howard flung himself down on the sofa, and a look of pain came into his face. And that is the end of chapter 2.
my dear listeners. Thank you, as always, for being my audience today. I look forward to seeing you next time. For now, take care of yourselves. <laughs>